It's the afternoon of May 3rd, 2011. We're at the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers University for the Center on the American Governor. I'm Michael Aaron of NJN News. Uh, we're going to interview Ralph Izzo for the Thomas H. Kane Archive today. Ralph uh, is well known in New Jersey today as the chairman and CEO of PSEG, the uh, utility, but 25 years ago or thereabouts, he was a senior policy advisor in Governor Kane's office dealing with energy issues, among other things. And that's what we're going to learn about this afternoon. Ralph, how did you get involved with Governor Kane? Well, I had spent a year in Washington as a policy advisor to Senator Bill Bradley. It's a fellowship program. It was the American Physical Society. It was a time of Star Wars Strategic Defense Initiative, and physicists were actually thought to be people who could help provide policy advice. I went down to D.C. for a year, had a great time with the senator, did some interesting stuff that was quite different than where I was full-time. I had been a research scientist at Princeton University. I went back down to D.C. after my one year was over for a scientific meeting, and I stopped into the office, and the chief of staff there mentioned that the governor was putting together a policy office for his second term, and they were looking for people with technical backgrounds. And would I have an interest? And I said, sure. And I submitted a resume and was, was hired. Senator Bradley's chief of staff referred you to the Republican governor's office. And, and you know, Michael, it was interesting. I, I was so politically naive that I thought nothing of it. I had worked for a Democrat. I, at the time, I was a registered Democrat because I'd spent all my life in New York City. And in New York City, in those days, to vote for the mayor, the real vote took place during the primary. In the general, it was a foregone conclusion that the Democrat would win. So I registered as a Democrat, not, because of any, not for any partisan reasons. I just wanted to vote for the mayor of New York City. And when I moved to Princeton, New Jersey, after finishing my graduate degree, I just didn't change my party affiliation. I just, I just fell into a bad habit. Obviously, I re-registered to vote. But it didn't mean anything to me to be a Democrat or a Republican or to be an independent. Uh, I assume that to vote in a primary, you should be registered to some party, so since I had been that way for a few years. But anyway, when, uh, when uh, Marsha Aronoff, the chief of staff in Bradley's office, mentioned this to me, I just thought, no big deal. So when I applied for the position, I thought, no big deal. I never mentioned it. <laughs> we'll come back to that in a second, <laughs> but let's step back. Uh, you say you spent all your life in New York City. Uh, what part of New York City did you grow up in? So I was born in Brooklyn and raised in Queens and went to school in Manhattan. And you went to Columbia, I believe? That's correct. Believe. That's right. That's right. So I, I was undergraduate, there. graduate? So I, I was there for uh, all my degrees. I was there as an undergrad in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and as a graduate student in a strangely uh, formed department called Applied Physics, which was a combination of electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and physics. So. Um, what did your parents do? My father was a refrigeration uh, engineer, which is a fancy title for a, a boiler room operator. He, he worked in a large commercial office building in downtown Manhattan. He was a member of, uh, of a labor union, and he made sure that the HVAC, the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning units were, were working appropriately. And my mother was a seamstress. She worked on a sewing machine in a in really what was a sweatshop. Uh, I mean, I, I remember picking her up from work later on in life when I had a driver's license. And if you went into the, into the facility, there was just large fans to cool people off and not very bright lighting. I mean, and this was 1978. You know, we're not talking the 40s here. So. Hmm. Do you have siblings? I do, an older brother and an older sister. Uh, so after college, what did you do? After graduate school, what did you do? So after graduate school, I went to uh, Princeton University as a postdoctoral research associate working on fusion energy research. And I did that from 81 through 85, and then the SDI initiative came into play. And um, you worked at the plasma physics lab in that's right. Princeton? Is that part of the university? Well, it's, it, yes, but let me qualify that. Uh, it is, it's a Department of Energy lab that is managed by the university. So as a research physicist there, I was not a faculty member of the university. I, was not, uh, I wasn't a student at the university. I was 
an employee of Princeton University, but it was tied to that DOE contract. SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, yeah. you uh, went to work in Bradley's office on that issue. I would imagine Senator Bradley was against the Strategic Defense well, Initiative. Well, so it was kind of interesting. I, I should be more precise. So when that initiative, when that issue came up, there was a lot of discussion in the physics community about it. There was a world-renowned physicist, uh, Edward Teller, uh, Sidney Drell at Stanford, and all of them, they were the ones who were being asked their opinion. As a junior member in the community, I suddenly found public policy to be fascinating, given the physics implication of it, and that led me to apply for the fellowship. I wasn't recruited by Senator Bradley to work on SDI. As a matter of fact, when I got there, I did things like World Health, uh, the Farm Bill, uh, immunizable diseases, uh, lead in drinking water, a, a potpourri of things that uh, sort of surprised me in terms of what a legislative assessment has to manage their way through. Well, uh, the Strategic Defense Init Initiative was something that President Reagan yes, pushed. Yes, and, and, and Bradley was not in favor of it. He was he not, was not in, favor in favor of it. Yes. How about you? Were you in favor of it? No, I thought that the technical challenges were just enormous and they would what was the concept again so in the 30 concept, seconds? Yeah, no, the concept was that you would be able to build an electronic shield and you would be able to knock out of the sky any inbound uh, missiles. And the theory was if you had confidence that you could do that, it greatly reduced the incentive to be the first strike. Right? So, so we had in place at the time a policy of mutual assured destruction. So you're not going to shoot at me because you know I can shoot at you. Uh, and, the, and the fear was always, well, if I think you're going to shoot at me, am I going to shoot first? So let's get away from that by having a system in place that says, well, if I think you're going to shoot at me, I don't have to shoot first, because when you shoot at me, I'll be able to knock yours out of the sky. Uh, it's I, all coming back to uh, me. It would have greatly destabilized the mutual balance of exactly terror. Exactly right. So, so, so the, the <laughs> that's, that's well said, the balance of terror. So the concern was if we developed this, we were going to accelerate the arms race on the part of some people. If we developed this, we would accelerate the arms race in a new dimension. Uh, smart weapons that could escape this, uh, uh, building defensive shields of your own. And in fact, there was some thinking that was, wow, now you could be offensive if you had the defensive shield and not worry about the retaliatory strike. So did you work on that issue for, I, with I, Bradley? I did not. No, did I did, it was I just did that not. issue that got you interested exactly. in going to Washington and getting involved in public policy. Had, you, you say you found policy suddenly fascinating. Had you been interested uh, as a student or as a kid in political issues, well, political I, life? Yeah, I, I fondly remember as a graduate student at Columbia sitting around a table, not that dissimilar to this, it was equally uh, in need of, of help. <laughs> and in, in chairs that were actually worse than these, you know, you'd sit in them and you'd sink in about a foot and a half. And uh, invariably, you would participate with your fellow graduate students whenever your research was giving you a hell of a time and you couldn't get anything done. So that's when we would gather and instead of discussing, in my case, magnetohydrodynamic equations, we'd get together and spend a half an hour and solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue because that was just much simpler than partial differential equations or so we thought, obviously, we were wrong. But so I had probably a little bit more than an average person's interest in it. And, uh, but, but I would not say I was a student of it or I'd been active in any, in any way, shape, or form. How old were you in 1985? So in 85, I was 28 years old. 28. Uh, so Marsha Aronoff, the chief of staff to right. Bill Bradley, says the governor is looking for a science policy advisor? No, or? she said he was looking for policy advisors. And Marsha... For the second term. For a second term. And Marsha uh, was a fabulous uh, boss. And... She thought that I had done well for, for Bill for, for that year and had a, the ability to take complicated issues and synthesize them and describe them. And uh, she thought that I might find this of interest and, and perhaps could be helpful. And, and so you, who did, who did, do you remember who, recru who you interviewed with? Yeah, so I, so Mar I asked Marcia, you know, what, what do I do? And she gave me the name of a, of a woman then, the governor's chief of policy and planning, Brenda Davis. I sent Brenda a letter. I asked Marsha to, if she would serve as a reference, and she did. That resulted in a couple of interviews. I, I don't remember if it was two or three or one. It was definitely more than one. And, and then I was, uh, extended an offer in July of 86 and stayed through the last day. So uh, six months into Kane's second term. Right. 
Um, do you recall how long Brenda Davis had been she the had head been of policy? She, yes, she had been there for a very brief period of time. She had been there maybe six months. Brenda had been a fairly senior level person in DEP in the first term under then Commissioner Bob Huey. I don't remember Brenda's exact title then, but she had a long history uh, working at EPA and working on the Hill in environmental matters. And the way it was described to me at the time was that the governor wanted to put together uh, a group of people that were politically removed and that would just work on policy and think of things that would be good for the state and conserve as national models. And what appealed to me about that is that Bradley's office prided itself on being a policy organization. And this just seems so consistent and you know, quite candidly both seemed to me at the time to be fairly middle of the road uh, moderate people, which I view myself as. I mean, I, I don't think I fall into one neat category or, or another in terms of uh, traditional party positions. So th the thought of working on a policy appealed to me in the areas that Brendan and I talked about it first was science and technology. Then there was an organization called the Commission on Science and Technology that was fairly new. She thought I could help in that regard. Uh, energy was undergoing some deregulation at the national level. She wanted to know what it meant uh, for, for the state level. And higher education was in the throes of pleading for and about to get a major bond act approved. And the question was, how can this money be wisely spent? What does it mean for the research agenda of the state tomorrow? So, the, so my real uh, reason for joining was more in, the, in those areas. I end up spending most of my time working on environmental issues, but that wasn't the game plan originally. <coughs> Higher education bond issue of 1988 is being talked about today because there hasn't been one since. since then, right. Um, who did you work with in the governor's office or in the cabinet? So, so in the governor's office, there was a group of us in policy and planning some of the names were uh, David Racine, uh, Ann Hoskins, Paul Bardak, uh, Chuck Newcomb. Those were all the senior policy advisors. And then Brenda was uh, in charge of the office. Uh, gosh, I'm forgetting Barbara, Barbara's last name. She was our deputy. Oh, well, sh shame on me. Uh, and then in terms of the agencies, most of the people I worked with were in, either in DEP. At the time, it was Dick Dooling. Later on, it became Don DeAso. In Commission of Science and Technology, it was a gentleman named Ed Cohen. Higher education still had a chancellor. At the time, it was Ted Hollander. And for a brief period of time, I did some health policy work, and that was with Molly Coy. She was the commissioner she of health. She was commissioner of health at the time. How about the governor? Did you uh, meet him? Uh, you, you didn't know him before you I got did hired. not know him before. And my interactions with him increased over the span of the three years, obviously from the point where I maybe saw him once every few months and communicated primarily in memos, and then towards the end it was, it was more regular, but not daily. I mean, it would be as the need arose on all occasions. Um, what was the first issue you remember having worked on, big, you know, yeah, important? So, so the first issue I remember was, uh, at the time, uh, my, my current company, PSEG, had just finished building a nuclear power plant, the Hope Creek nuclear power plant. And I believe at the time it was uh, built, it was expected to cost $450, $500 million. It was built during the era when Three Mile Island occurred. So there was a tremendous amount of regulatory upheaval and changes that were required in nuclear power plants that were under construction at the time. And whenever you have such a large infrastructure project and you then say, I want to change this, that incredibly uh, impacts the increases, to be specific, the cost of the project. So what was supposed to have been a half billion dollar power plant turned out to be $4.5 billion. And uh, there were a couple of folks in the legislature, in particular Senator Dan Dalton, if I remember correctly, who said, this is ridiculous. Uh, the, the customer should not bear the cost of this. And I remember getting a couple of letters that were sent to the governor. Brenda forwarded them to me and said, what do you think? And my initial reaction was, well, what do I think? This, this is nonsense. I mean, how could something that was supposed to be 500 million be 4.5 billion? And then I did some research. And I found that in fact, uh, regulators had known all along of the cost of escalation. And in fact, the company had worked with the Board of Public Utilities at the time to say, 
Do you still think we need this? Should we continue to go forward? So there had been a partnership, so to speak, between the, the company and the regulatory body with jurisdiction to proceed. So I thought, well, okay, it really isn't fair to say that only $500 million can be recovered because this money was spent in consultation with decision makers in government at the time. The decision makers would ultimately decide how much, mo how much money gets recovered. But by the same token, the public needs to be protected from these kind of cost overruns in the future. So what came out of that was some legislation that created something called a certificate of need, where you had to actually not have conversations, but you had to have a ruling, a formal ruling by the Board of, Pu Board of Public Utilities that said you needed this. And then we began a whole dialogue around how we could make electricity generation and distribution more competitive. And we began a, a multi-year process. It was a two or three year set of, of, of uh, task force meetings. And we had some of the world's most renowned economists come and speak to us. Ed Kahn of, uh, uh, Alfred Kahn of uh, Cornell came and addressed this. Uh, Bobby Willig at Princeton came and worked with us. People who were instrumental in railroad deregulation, telecom deregulation. And I will tell you that we came out with two specific reports, Governor's Task Force on Electricity Regulation, which were not implemented. And I really, I say this with some immodesty, uh, they were far ahead of their time. Those practices that we were advocating back then in the late 1980s are in place today. But they didn't get implemented until 15, 20 years later. Do you recall who was the president of the BPU back at that time? I believe it was Barbara Kern. I'm pretty sure it was Barbara Kern. There may have been a switch at the time. But it was Pardon me? Christy Whitman. Oh, Christy Whitman was late. It was right after Barbara. That's right. Huh. Um, before we get into a couple other issues, uh, to what extent is it your understanding that the whole idea of policy, a policy shop in the governor's office was new under Kane? Uh, my impression is that it was new. Now, I don't know whether or not that's accurate. I, again, I didn't go back and research whether or not there had been offices before that did that kind of work. What was clearly new, and it caused a little bit of uh, eyebrow raising, was the group of people who were put in there. Uh, you had a PhD plasma physicist. You had That's you. Uh, that was me. You had a master's Woodrow Wilson graduate. You had uh, you know folks who did not have deep New Jersey roots. I had been in the state five years. What we had were you know, strong backgrounds in the subject areas that we were supposed to develop policy around. And so as a result, there was an element of let's make sure these people don't get us in trouble and say and do something uh, that's inconsistent with the culture or the different uh, traditions that may exist in the state. And I must tell you that there, there were more than a couple of comments around why are these people getting high paying jobs? Because they were, you know, I, was, I, think I, I think I was making like 50 or $55,000 in those days, which was pretty good. So it was less than what I was making in other places, but it was still a pretty good salary at the time. This notion of you know, who's Ralph Izzo? What, what has he done? You know, did, he, did he help in any way? And, and the answer was no, I hadn't. You know, I, what I was bringing to the table hopefully was new ideas and new things to help New Jersey in the future, but, but I hadn't knocked on any doors or stuffed flyers in envelopes or raised money or done anything like that. Did you enjoy being in that culture at the state? Oh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It was interesting, actually. I hope this is interesting. Uh, the, the one year in Washington, I, I just... I was able to help Bill Bradley do things, and it was always clear to me that I didn't do anything. I helped him to do things that were so good. Uh, we, we literally outlawed the use of lead in potable drinking water. We increased money for immunizable diseases that were claiming hundreds of thousands of children's lives in third world countries. And we did that in a year. And you know, we, we did a bunch of other things where he hopefully cast intelligent votes, but those two initiatives were his, and we, we got them passed into law. And my reason for being a physicist was to solve the energy crisis. And what I saw in my research was that while fusion energy research, which I was doing, really is a holy grail, that there was a better than even chance I would go to my grave and never see it become a reality. But that's necessary, that you, you need to move the ball forward one inch at a time in, in, in what's basic research. But I got addicted to the near-term benefit of public policy. 
Now, having said that, I, I, I should point out that I didn't see the implementation of those things. That was left to EPA and the World Health Organization. But it was really great to be part of knowing that you enabled something. So when I came to the governor's office, that's what attracted me. And I found that in, a, in, in New Jersey, at least, with the governor having the vast power that, that the office has, it was even more rewarding. We created something called the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute. We actually watched the building go up, and so a bunch of toxicologists and epidemiologists come to New Jersey who hadn't been here before to study radon in homes and how people's uh, lives are shortened by that. So at the end of the, to, to get to your question, at the end of the Kane administration, my decision was, okay, I need to leave now so that I can go to the private sector and understand how government directly affects regulated businesses so that I can come back and be a better public servant. So I went to work for an environmental services company. And uh, I was trying to locate solid waste management facilities in the Midwest. It was a New Jersey company. Uh, and it was rough. I mean, it was really rough. My record was two state trooper cruisers to escort me back to my hotel uh, to avoid the, uh, the, the violence that was threatened by the public members of, at, at the meetings that I was conducting. In the Midwest? Oh, yeah. No, no, well, in the, the, you'll recall in that time, solid waste was in a crisis. That was the era of the floating barge up and down the East Coast. And uh, showing people a business card in Ohio that had a New Jersey office meant to them that I was there to bring East Coast waste to the Midwest. Uh, candidly, I fit a certain stereotype, uh, my last name being what it is, and my Italian heritage fit that stereotype. So I, 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 I was treated pretty roughly by that. And uh, I'll never forget, I never told my wife the full truth about what I did for a living, because it was, you know, I, I told her what I did, but I didn't tell her that I sometimes needed police escorts back to the hotel. And one time, I did a project in Western New York I was helping a, another colleague out up there, and uh, I, I didn't realize that the local news uh, reached my brother-in-law, who lived about 40 miles away. And uh, there was a gentleman in the high school auditorium with a bucket of tar and a bag of feathers who kept threatening to tar and feather me. So when I got to the hotel that night, I think that was, I don't I even remember if I needed an escort. If I did, it, maybe it was only one police cruiser. My wife just said, uh, so how was your day today? And I said, fine, because my brother-in-law had called her. And she says, anything unusual? And I didn't lie to her. I said, no. <laughs> she said, well, what did you do tonight? I said, oh, I had a public meeting. How was the crowd? The, as always. <laughs> I, I think I lasted another few weeks at that job, and I had to then leave. So. Um, you mentioned Bill Bradley. Uh, there were a bunch of people uh, around Bradley whom I would call acolytes of Bill Bradley, people who really believed that he was a visionary uh, and that he should have been president of the United States at some point in his life. Were you one of those? I, I was. I am. I was and I am. You know, I don't know where, I don't talk to Bill that frequently now. It's probably been a couple of years. Uh, much like Tom Kane, uh, Bill was in it to do the right thing. And, and, and it's interesting, both of them used very similar words in that regard. And I can remember being in meetings where they would be cautioned by, by, I don't mean this pejoratively, but by, by political advisors, that here's the backlash that you're going to experience. And, and they would say things like, but it's the right thing. And, and Bill, I, you know, I can remember being on the floor of the Senate and we were uh, leading a charge against sugar subsidies in the farm bill. These were really a handful of subsidies that were be given, being given to large corporate farms. And they were crushing small family farms and they were inflating the cost of everything that uses sugar, and as you know, everything uses sugar. And Bill was just taking the good government position that we ought to stop doing this. This was the time of the Reagan budget deficits, deficits spiraling out of control, if only we would have those deficits today. Uh, and Gary Hart, remember the, the presidential candidate, uh, you know, neither of them will remember this. It, it affected me because I was all of 27 years old. Gary Hart walked past Bill and said, Bill, why are you doing this to the party? And now you know what Bill's answer was. Because it's the right, right thing, thing to, to do. do. That, that amendment went down in flames. I think we lost 95 to 5. <laughs> so 
So the first big issue was this electric, uh, electricity, describe it. Yeah, so it was a power plant that cost more than it should. Now, one of the things Governor Kane was outstanding at doing, I believe at least it was outstanding, is he picked talented people and then he trusted them to make decisions. So he was not in the habit, at least I didn't see it, where he would call the BPO and say, this is what you must do. He had talented people at the BPU. They had the information. They had the details. He trusted them to make decisions. Uh, he asked Brenda to get the opinion of the people in his office, uh, I think just to have another point of view. But he was not one to insert himself and say, my instincts say the following and the heck with the 12 years of history behind this construction and this regulatory dialogue. So, so that issue really, uh, the, the specific issue of the power plant got handled at the BPU because my advice, whether it had an influence or not, I really can't say, was this is a BPU matter. It, it, it turned out to be what was done was to leave it to the BPU, but I think really the reason why that was done because that was the governor's style of management. It really had nothing to do with a two-page memo I had written being on the job all of three days. What it then the precipitated is, as I mentioned, these series of task forces. And in that case, the communications I had with the governor uh, were really, I, the, the feeling I had from them was that the governor didn't view it as a critical issue for him, that his focus was on education, the environment, the economy. And we talked about, most of the time through memos and notes back, the, the cost of energy and its effect on the economy and the jobs that are created by energy. And, and so the feedback I had was, okay, this does seem like a worthwhile effort, but you've got to build a consensus around it. You know, I, uh, the administration did not feel that it needed to be the one to say, let's deregulate in this way or let's regulate in that way. So I tell that story because I felt that way often with Governor Kane. He would let you run with a good idea. If you had something that you, you had to flesh out through Brenda and then, and then the governor so it wasn't completely insane, they would allow you to try to build a coalition around it, to build uh, a recognition that this was a good you, thing You, at your level, would have to build the, the consensus in the state? Well, that's right. And, but, but, you know, funny things happen when you call and say, my name is Ralph Izzo, senior policy advisor to Governor Kane. And then you, you, there, were, there were certain tools at your disposal. You, you, based on what you had advised people, you'd get a paragraph into the state of the state address. Uh, you would then hold a meeting and, and you'd, you'd invite certain people and folks who wanted to be there you know, suddenly start saying, well, why can't I be part of this? And, and uh, you'd interest some legislators because th there were, these were significant issues. So I don't think there's, a, there's a, a manual to how to get it done, but that's the approach we took. And I don't want to repeat myself, but as a result, we did get some very, very influential, well-regarded people to participate. Um. Would you say that the net effect of that work was to deregulate or to re-regulate or? Yeah, no, I think the net effect of that work was really to, to aerate the soil, maybe planted the seeds, but that's maybe being a little generous towards further deregulation. Really what happened subsequent to that is there was a massive push for deregulation at the federal level. And once that occurred in the 90s, so the governor was already out of office. Then the state revisited the issue in the late 90s, early turn of the century, and then the state decided to, re -regulate, to deregulate. I do remember several people in the deregulation conversations took place in the early turn of the century. Now, by this point, I was two jobs removed from the state house, reminding me of the efforts we had undertaken back in 86, 87, and 88. And, uh, and I actually took out some of the old documents, and they were still relevant. What were the other major issues you worked on? Probably the most significant issue that really would be a mistake to not talk about was the whole effort to protect the coast. Uh, this was a time, you may recall, when there was a tremendous amount of public uproar over waste, in particular medical waste, floating up on the beaches. It was really interesting. So what attracted us to this was beaches were being closed because of waste coming onto shore. When we went and talked to experts at DP, they alerted us in the governor's office to the fact that, you know, everyone knows that this stuff is disgusting and nobody wants it. The reality is when it's spent that much time out in the ocean, it's not a 
uh, infectious risk to the public. It's, it's certainly an aesthetic problem. It's a tourism risk. And to the extent that one hurts themselves by, by stubbing a toe or, or stabbing themselves, that's not a good thing. But it's not like you, or you were at risk of getting AIDS, and this was the early part of the AIDS scare. And what DEP advises that our real problem is the number of times we have to close beaches due to stormwater runoff and the f f bacteria that gets washed into the ocean, as well as the heavy hydrocarbons that get washed into the ocean and stay near the shore. And then we pursued a little further, well, what, you know, where does that come from? And the answer was two words, population density. So the world, what, what the media and what the, the average person was focused on were, at the time there was a company called Siba Gaigi in Tom's River with a big pipe spewing ethyl methyl nasty stuff into the ocean. It was fully regulated by DEP at levels that I believe DEP argued were, were, uh, were appropriate for that kind of a extended outflow. And people were upset over this stuff floating up on the beach. But the real problem was, uh, to quote Pogo, you know, we've seen the enemy and it's us. We were building more houses. We were paving over more ground. We had more cars driving. So the whole issue of land use was what needed to be tackled. Well, talk about a tough problem. Uh, one of the most expensive parts of the state, one of the most rapidly growing parts of the state, and the solution to protecting this treasured resource was, in our proposal, state control of land use. Not a happy time. <laughs> so so we, we, we had a two-pronged effort. One was something called the 10-point plan, which was a series of things that people loved. It was things like uh, grant money to, town, to, to municipalities along the shore to have litter control uh, efforts. It was uh, money for beach replenishment. It was uh, uh, legislation that we would ask our congressional delegation to propose in Washington on, on, um, on, on solid waste management. It was uh, grants for, solid, for recycling programs in towns. So it was a whole series of things that the public believed really was the root of all of our problems. And then in addition to that, to make sure that there was a sustainable regional approach taking to managing this resource, well, we came up with an idea called the Coastal Commission. And the governor's emphatic emphasis, I think I just repeated myself, but anyway, his, he was emphatic that it had to be a regional body made up of local elected and uh, leading decision makers. So that he thought that it wasn't that Asbury Park didn't care about what happened to Asbury Park. They did. It was just that the water didn't respect the boundary between Asbury Park and Deal. So you really needed to get Deal and Asbury working well with Cape May Point and, and towns to the south. So we wanted to come up with this 15-person commission. I think eight of them were going to be uh, uh, named by local mayors, you know, d d freeholder groups, and I forget the exact uh, makeup of it, but largely local representation. But it would then have the authority to write a land use plan and a waste management plan for the region. Like a Pine Lands Commission extended to the shore. Exactly. And that's what hurt us, is that that simple analogy got translated into no growth as opposed to managed growth. So, so you know, we talked about things like at the time there was in, and I think there still is in place, uh, the Coastal Area Facilities Review Act, CAFRA. CAFRA. And there was a loophole in CAFRA that allowed you to build, I forget what it was, up to 24 units, I believe, and not get a DP permit. Well, guess what was being built up and down the shore right behind the dunes? 24 unit condominiums. Well, you know, with cars parked in the driveway, with people walking their dogs, with and all the stuff that, when you have enough of it, it seems crazy, but was contributing to the beach closures and to the, to the destruction of the habitat. So uh, we were talking about the fact that, well, we, we could simply amend CAFRA, but do you want DEP to simply uh, regulate all the construction, or do you want to do something different? Do you want to talk about the way in which you might have one coverage ratio for permeable surface in one area, but a different? coverage ratio for permeable surfaces in another area? Do you want to talk about places where maybe you want open space versus residential? The types of things you could do through CAFRA, 
but that would be better if there was a regional planning entity to do that. But unfortunately, uh, that just wasn't, it, it, people were really worried about the pylons. And in fact, there was a successful, probably the leading opponent who deserves most of the credit or discredit, depending on your point of view, for having stopped it was a senator from Ocean County named Len Connors. And Senator he was Con the mayor of Surf City. He was the mayor of Surf City. And, to, and you know, Senator Con Connors one day talking to me in, in what I believe was a truly heartfelt manner, because I was still fairly young and Senator Connors was probably double my age, or said, I can remember people coming to me to the point of despondency over what happened to them in the Pylons Act. Their whole life savings in a piece of land that they thought they might be able to sell and then do something else after they retired, they couldn't do. And, and you know, I'm paraphrasing him there, but his exact words after that were, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And there was no way to convince him that it could be done in some sort of a regional partnership method, ma manner. And he was successful, at really, at getting people to just uh, remember the, uh, the Pinelands and while the Pinelands was very successful at preserving that resource, we realized the shore was past that. You weren't going to preserve the Jersey Shore. I mean, what you were going to try and do is manage its continued growth going forward in a way that didn't result in, at one point, I think we had several hundred beach closings during the summer. I mean, it was, it was, it was getting absurd. Interesting. Um, you mentioned the higher education bond issue. Was that difficult to Passed? Do you recall how big it was? No, I think it, was, it passed overwhelmingly. It was, it was uh, quite easily done. Uh, so it was a $90 million bond issue, if I, if I remember That's correctly. That's small by today's standards. Well, by today's standards it is. And we, we did a lot of good things with that. Uh, it was used extensively by the Commission on Science and Technology to create, create centers of excellence, many of which still exist today. Probably the most successful ones were things that fed into our biotech pharmaceutical uh, traditions, the uh, Center for Advanced Biotechnology and Medicine in particular comes to mind, in addition to the Environmental and Occupational Health, Health Sciences Institute. But then we created things like a food technology center, a fiber optic center, a uh, center for advanced materials, which became a ceramic center. And, I, and I'm pretty sure, I don't have numbers to quote, but that helped researchers attract a fair amount of federal dollars into the state. That Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute has been very involved in uh, dealing with the health problems of the first responders on 9-11. Okay, I wasn't aware of that, but it doesn't surprise yes. me. Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, any other issue that uh, jumps to mind? Uh, so, you no, know, I think higher, higher ed, uh, science and technology, environment, energy, dabbled for about two weeks on DRGs, I can't remember what they stand for. Diagnostic the group Related group groups. groups. And in fact, Governor Kane said to us yesterday when we interviewed him for this archive, uh, when we told him we were interviewing he, you, that was the issue that uh, he connected with you. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I, I did that in my very early days uh, for the governor's office, and it made a lot of sense. It was basically this notion that if you set a price for a certain service, then you created an incentive for the medical profession to get more efficient. So if, if you and I are doctors and we know we're gonna get paid $100 to do something, then we're both gonna try and do the, the right thing, provide the right level of care for $99. And then the key is every few years, you recalculate what that service is actually costing. So you create this incentive for people to go to provide the service below that cost, and then when you refresh, well, now there's enough people providing it below that cost, and you can lower the price. Well, that that system existed, right? DRGs existed, or uh, you, you know, Michael, it's a, it's a test of my. It, it definitely did. Uh, I think because what, it was very unpopular. Yeah, it in certain was. Corners. And what we were trying quarters. to do was figure out to what extent it needed to be modified and expanded. And uh, I had zero background in the medical profession. I had an analytic background. I understood economics. I understood simple models. Uh, Kane, Kane spoke of it yesterday as 
very cutting edge. It was absolutely cutting edge. No, no, no. Molly Coy was a huge proponent of it. Uh, there, there, it, it received national attention as a way to control health care expense. But In a way, I think it was kind of a, a precursor to managed care. To managed care. That's exactly right. But I, but I must admit, I spent probably the first three to six months of my tenure with the governor on that and the next three and a half years on the Coastal Commission. <laughs> um, what did you think of Tom Kane? I, at I, the time. At the time. I thought that he was just an inspirational leader. He, he had an ability to be balanced, to be forever optimistic. He, he has a fundamental belief in the goodness of people. And he has this ability to look past in any large population. You have a distribution, right? And there's some folks who maybe are a little bit more selfish, some who will do anything for everybody else. But for the most part, the rest of us fall somewhere in between. And Tom Kane believed that the rest of us who fall somewhere in between are basically good and care about others. And because of that, he was always willing to just give the benefit of the doubt, look for another solution. And, um, and I just I saw that so many different ways, whether it was this power plant or whether it was the Coastal Commission or whether it was investing in the future through science and technology. Uh, what was interesting to me was, again, my political naivete just came across in so many ways. There was a lot of chatter at the time of the governor being vice presidential or presidential material. And I guess it was a U.S. News named him one of the two or three top governors in the nation when he got reelected. And clearly he had won in very non-traditional constituency, um, among very non-traditional constituencies for Republicans. So, so it was justified. The state was firing on all cylinders. He won with an overwhelming mandate. He had uh, captured a high percentage of votes in traditionally Democratic... Uh, in his re-election. In his re-election, absolutely. So uh, there was a lot of chatter about that, never from him. In every conversation I was in with him, there was never an indication of what does this mean for the nation. It was always an, an indication, of, well, how does this affect New Jersey? And I just thought, this man is so incredibly balanced. He's so sane, even though everyone around him <laughs> right now is kind of getting a bit frothy. But now, you know, maybe when he was talking to Mrs. Kane or his closest advisors, there was a different conversation, but I never saw it. How was he as a communicator to the pub public at large? That's interesting. You know, I, he was, you know, he was not Ronald Reagan nor Barack Obama in that regard. Uh, but he, he had a self-effacing humility and a credibility that just disarmed people. Uh, you know, I, I'm not one to speak, but his, you know, his, his style of dress was not highly polished and right out of central casting. His, his uh, manner of speaking had a, not a typical New Jersey accent, if you will. People thought he was from New England. So, so he, was, uh, he was disarming. I mean, he, he didn't come across as fancy or slick or some of the things that, unfortunately, some stereotypes that one can negatively associate with someone who rises to that level of prominence. And I think that people just felt comfortable around him and trusted him. To what extent was he lucky to have served at a time of uh, Tremendous economic growth, not, the, not, not when he first came in necessarily, but the 80s were a booming time, were they I, not? I, I, they, they were, and there's no question there was an element of luck. But here's the measure of Tom Kane. If you remember what happened when he left office was Governor Florio came in and the world fell apart, not because of Governor Florio, but because of an economic cycle. And I can remember on more than one occasion, he was, he, Governor Kane was asked, what does he think of Governor Florio's tax increase, which was what was going on at the time in terms of public outrage. And Governor Kane's response was, it's always easy to govern in years of prosperity. It's a lot more difficult when you are in an economic downturn and tax receipts are down and services still have to be provided. So, I mean, he had no reason to do that. This was somebody from a different party. I'm sure, I don't remember the details, I'm sure Governor Florio did his fair share of 
well, if Governor Kane hadn't done this or that or the other thing, we wouldn't be in this shape. But, um, but Governor Kane just said the right thing. I mean, he said the, the truth, but I, it really took the high road. Why do you think he didn't move on to higher office or to Washington? I don't know that the U.S. Senate is a higher office, but it's a different office. Yeah, uh, I've never had a conversation with him about it. My sense is he wanted to stay physically in New Jersey. Uh, you know, even, even if one concludes he didn't want a higher office, and notwithstanding the, the outstanding institution that Drew is, he probably, if he wanted to lead a university, he probably could have had his choice of many universities. But he chose a New, a New Jersey university. So, so my, my guess is he wanted to stay in the state. I The state's image uh, is something that he takes pride in having changed or enhanced. Uh, is that your recollection? Also? I do, I, I do, because the image he portrayed to a certain extent was patrician. It was uh, New Jersey and you perfect together. So there was, a, there was an element of, of civility and stature that he portrayed. Uh, New Jersey doesn't always have that, that image, right? So whether it's the Soprano state or the Snooky state or whatever current pop culture uh, unfortunately burdens us with, he was the antithesis of that. He was a gentleman. Uh, he was uh, viewed as a centrist, as somebody who can appeal to a broader constituency than just a, a narrowly defined one. What do you think his legacy is or what, what are the pieces of his legacy that stand out in your recollection? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are numerous components. I mean, as a legislator, he was the author of CAFRA. He was a principal in the Pinelands Act. Uh, so, so clearly, an environmental legacy has been was huge under Governor Kane. Uh, I think that what he did for education reform, in terms of creating, uh, making teaching a very respected profession, one where we created an alternate route and said uh, our future, the future of our, our children is, is the most important thing we can leave behind. Uh, and I think to go back to what you said, the pride he put in all of us to be from New Jersey. Uh, it was no longer something that you know, Rodney Dangerfield could use in his nightclub act. And that's probably the biggest, the biggest legacy he created. You say you stayed right up until the end. Uh, it was all good? Um, there were a couple of times that were rough, but not because of the governor's office. I remember some pretty nasty letters and local newspaper reactions along the Jersey Shore pertaining to the Coastal Commission. Again, uh, the misinterpretation of what we were trying to do was take people's property rights away from them. So that, though, there were some tough times there. But other than that, I, I, as I said, I left thinking what I need to do is go private sector for a while so I can come back. And have you? I didn't. You know, so a funny thing happened uh, on the way to the forum. I, I, I spent uh, four years in environmental services and then at, at PSEG. And I was fortunate enough to be promoted several steps. But uh, when uh, Governor Whitman won, I. I, I remember seeing her at a Chamber of Commerce trip. She probably won't remember this. I'm sure she won't remember this. And I said to her, Governor, I, I am very happily employed, but my plan was always to work in regulated businesses and then come back to government. So if you need help, I'd be more than happy to, to help you either at the DEP or at the BPU. And, but again, I was not active in her campaign. I wasn't active in Governor Florio's campaign. I wasn't active in Governor Kane's campaign. So I was always this sort of strange duck who wanted prominent positions without doing what I, I think a lot of people do to, to, to be uh, more heavily involved in uh, elected uh, office politics. So uh, literally three days later, she was terrific. She must have told someone. And I received a phone call from a gentleman whose name I don't remember, but he was the director of the electric division at the BPU or something like that. and. Uh, this is going to sound really pompous, I don't mean it to, but I had really moved at PSE&G quite a bit. 
And he called and said, well, I, I got a call from the governor's appointment secretary saying that we should interview you for some position in here. And we have manager this and manager that. What position are you interested in? And I said, well, unfortunately, your boss's boss's position. <laughs> and he chuckled and I chuckled and I said, I really do thank you. But obviously, we have different expectations and I, I, I don't want to create any sort of stir. So I'll try to do good by doing well. And, uh, and I didn't go back. Uh, do you, uh, you told us early on that you were a Democrat mm -hmm. when you were young. Mm -hmm. uh, do you identify with a political party I, at the moment? Yeah, I, I, no, I don't. I do identify with, with positions. I, I consider myself fiscally very conservative. I consider myself environmentally very progressive. Uh, and those are the two areas where I tend to uh, fall into categories pretty easily. So I run around the country saying we need to do something about climate change. Uh, people don't ask me, but if, but if I'm at a party, I, I decry and scream about the economic burdens that we're saddling future generations with and how if any of us ran our household the way we run our federal finances, we would all be out in the street somewhere. So, but on other issues, I think it's just sort of case by case. Um, you've risen through PS. E and G, P S E G, the holding company. Um, uh, how did that happen? That that one is better asked of others. I mean, what happened is every, I, I could tell you what occurred. I don't know how it occurred, but every 18 months, I was just given a little bit more responsibility and a, another challenge, and things seemed to be handled okay and surrounded by good people and. Make sure you give them credit for the good work they do, and then you're given more responsibility. And, and then uh, you know, a little bit of it is a lot of it is luck. I was the right age. My chairman retired at 65 when I was 48. You, you don't want to name a new chairman who's 60, because you want them to have more than five years. You want them to have seven to ten years. So being in the right place at the right time, and hopefully doing some good work. Um. PSE&G is an important corporate citizen in this state. I hope so. So you're still involved in the public policy mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. state, but from a, the private sector. Right. Is that fair to say? I think that is fair to say, and we, we pride ourselves on that. Uh, you know, a third of our business is just our regulated utility. Uh, by law, all of our customers are New Jerseyans. We, we, can't, we physically can't get a customer somewhere else. Uh, unless we buy another company that, that does it somewhere else. Uh, the other two-thirds of our business is part of a multi-state power pool, which has New Jersey as an important customer, but has other states as an important customer, too. So one of the benefits I have in terms of the shareholder base we have is it's, it's a shareholder base that invests for the long term. And what that means is that we have a 107-year-old company that wants to reach 200 years, and the way you do that is by doing what's right by your customers. So while I do worry about quarterly earnings, and we'll be announcing them in two days, I don't obsess over quarterly earnings. I obsess more over what the next five years looks like. So that allows me really to be a partner, us to be a partner with state government, and say, look, you, know, you may think this is good for the customer, but here's how it's going to come back to bite you, or here's what we can do in addition to make it even better for the customer. Uh, because candidly, New Jersey pays a lot for its electricity. But as a percentage of its per capita income, it pays very little for its electricity. New Jersey is an expensive state. We don't have any indigenous fuel. Land is expensive. Labor is expensive. So, but fortunately, in general, we have high per capita income. Now, I know that it's always risky to talk in averages because there are people who have their homes being foreclosed nowadays and are having trouble making ends meet. But in general, when you look at a New Jerseyans, uh, the, the, their electric and gas bill as a percentage of their total income is small compared to the rest of the country. Uh, seems to me that governors have appointed you to various task forces, right. and w what all have you been tasked with by the public sector? So, so my, right now my biggest responsibility is chairman of the Board of Governors of Rutgers University. Who put you in that position? So, so. Uh, Governor Corzine named me to the board. 
uh, but I became the chairman under Governor Christie's administration. So, Does that mean you were Governor Christie's choice? Uh, no, the way it works uh, is that the Board of Governors elects the chairman, but candidly, out of respect for the governor, uh, who has a lot to say about a substantial portion of funding for the university, I made sure by personally telling the governor that this is what the board wanted to do so that he would have an opportunity uh, to say yes or no. And uh, let me not go further than simply say it was allowed to happen, you know, but obviously I, I think he allowed it to happen. So, so the governor doesn't appoint the chairman is what I'm saying, but clearly out of respect for the office, one makes sure that the governor's office knows what's intended to take place. And I've been chairman now for about 11 months. It feels like 11 years. It's a busy place, <laughs> Rutgers. There's no shortage of challenges and things to do. But uh, it's a place that is in, you know, an essential part of the state's future well-being and one that I'm willing and happy to spend time trying to help out. Is there a term that you serve? Uh, yes. So, so the, the being part of the Board of Governors is a six-year term. And then the chair of the Board of Governors is re-elected annually and can be re-elected no more than for three consecutive terms. Uh -huh. You think you'll stand for re-election? So I, I, I will stay. If the board wants me to stand for re-election, I will. But I won't. I'm, I can't think to the third year. So just I will stand for a second year if they want me to. How much of your time does uh, being chairman of the Rutgers Board of Governors consume? A lot. It depends on the time of year. But it's... It is without a doubt a couple of days a month, which is a lot for me. I'm on the Chamber of Commerce Board. I'm on the Executive Committee of the Edison Electric Institute. And the, the company is a full-time job. So, so having to carve out those, that time is sometimes challenging. Where do you live? I live in a central part of the state, in, in southern Middlesex County, Cranberry Township. And how do you look back on the four years you spent in government or in the Kane administration? I, you know, I, as an outstanding experience, one where we were able to do a lot of good. And I think it's helped me to become a better CEO. You think it helped you become the CEO? Uh, no doubt. It had a role in it. No doubt. Uh, if I hadn't met the people who I had met, and I hadn't been given the opportunities that I was given, um, I, I don't know that the path would have been the same. Have you stayed in touch with people from that some, time? Some. I've actually hired one from that time. And I've uh, holiday, it ranges from holiday cards to phone calls. But one of the junior policy advisors at the time was a woman named Ann Hoskins, who graduated Cornell undergrad, Princeton for a master's degree, and Harvard for a law degree. And she became a prominent regulatory attorney for uh, Verizon in their DC office and when we had an opening for a senior vice president of public affairs I called up Ann and said will you come join us and she did so I was lucky in that regard. And how about Tom Kane? do you ever see him? So I saw him uh, probably three months ago we talked a lot about the higher education task force report and I try to go to as many functions that honor him uh, I, 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 it, it's in spurts sometimes I I see him more often. Sometimes there's a little bit longer stretch. Can never see him enough. Uh, he's just a delightful person to be around. Well, you're one of the alumni who's done the best uh, <laughs> coming out of the Kane administration. Thanks for telling us uh, your version of those four years. Thank you, Michael. A pleasure.